What's going on YouTube? This is part two of my individual patrolling considerations video. Uh, in the first video we covered, I covered several things that, uh, you know, I, that I could do on my own. Uh, fortunately, I have a couple other guys here with me, so I'm going to utilize them today to cover some of those things I wanted to cover in the first video that I wasn't able to. So starting this out, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the uh, individual roles for a uh, fire team. So talking about fire teams, you typically have four uh, different team, team members. you got a team leader, a uh, automatic rifleman, an assistant automatic rifleman, and a rifleman. So what we're going to do with starting this video out is we're going to talk about some of those, those, uh, those billets and the considerations that you would use as far as gear is concerned um, starting this out. So I'm going to start this out talking about uh, team leader. Okay, so um, I got a few things laid out here. Now I've already kind of went into talking at length in the first video about the different types of gear you'll take, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Um, but talking, starting out for the uh, team leader. Your team leader gear is essentially going to be a lot of the same stuff that a rifleman has. Um, but you're going to have a little bit more. Obviously, you're in a leadership position, so you're going to have a little bit more than a, a team leader would have. Or, a, excuse me, a rifleman would have. Okay, but uh, again, you know, just rehashing uh, some of the gear. I've talked about this in the past. Like, you know, I am I like having the old school Alice gear when it comes to uh, long range patrols. Um, it's lightweight. I think it distributes gear very well. And uh, it's economic. Uh, it's e economical price and everything else. You know, it doesn't cost half as much as the uh, the Molly stuff. So you can get a lot of equipment for you know a fraction of the price, and it's still very functional. Um, you'll also see later, uh, my buddy Bruce. He's going to show one of his rigs. It's a it's a Molly type setup, and essentially it's just a modern day Alice setup. Um, so again, here's the uh, you know the uh, Alice setup I have that I'm going to be utilizing today. In the first video, it was uh, during the summertime, so. It was very green outside, so I had a different type of rig. This is the uh, Alice rig that I use when it's you know winter time. It's more tan. You got browns. You can see the environment right now. Um, but essentially, it's just Alice gear that I've uh, you know, spray painted and given a more of a, uh, a color scheme for this uh, time of year. You know, Alice gear. Each individual Alice pouch holds three magazines. So right here, I've got you know four Alice M16 mag pouches. And you know, three magazines in each one. I got 12 magazines on my person already, not including the, uh, the actual magazine that's in a weapon. Okay, so if you're going into the fight, <laughs> that's a lot of ass to bring with you right there. Um, frags, you know, these Alice pouches also have little frag holders. Okay, so you know, your M67 frag grenades can fit in there very well. Okay, so you got a little blue body here, but essentially it just goes into the side. And then this uh, retaining strap comes over the top and secures the uh, the frag in place. Okay, very quick, easy, accessible, and secure. Um, you know, Isles equipment. Uh, I got my my freaking K bar here on my shoulder. You know, easily accessible. I've already if you've seen my other videos. I talked about you know Marine and uh, Charlie Company, one first time fourth Marines in the in the Joff Cemetery. And he ran into a, an enemy uh, combatant when he was coming around the uh, the. Uh, a tombstone and they locked up and he was able to uh, stab that enemy combatant to death with his his bayonet because he had it readily accessible okay so i'm a firm believer in having this knife readily accessible and on your gear so that you can easily get to it if you need it um you know d-rings d-rings are just good pieces of gear for whatever reason like 101 different uses um all right so right here uh you know i just got an ifac on my gear so in an ifac you know it's just uh it's stuff that's going to save your life and Inside an IFAC, I have tourniquets, I've got, uh, you know, bandages, you know, I even, when in a combat scenario, uh, going on a combat patrol, I usually carry four tourniquets, I've talked to that, about that before, um, one for each major extremity, but your IFAC is essentially what's going to be used to save your life, okay, so, you know, put whatever you, what, whatever you need in there, um, but it's going to be used to save your life. If somebody comes upon you, they're going to use your equipment to, to repair your, your uh, injuries. Also on my rig, I got my, uh, you know, I got canteens. I've talked uh, about this canteens. I primarily use to just refill my Camelback. Um, I think this is an essential piece of gear. Camelbacks are amazing. They allow you to keep hydrating on the move. Um, so essentially, what my canteen is used for is refilling that Camelback. Um, you don't want to use. The reason I don't like sipping out of canteens is because, you know, as you're drinking that canteen. And you let's say you get to down to about a half a canteen, that water's gonna be swishing around. It's just more noise that you're making as you're moving you know, through your environment. 
Um, so canteens, you easily just you know, dump them into your, your camelback, and as you're drinking your water, you're sucking that air out as well, and uh, it's minimizing the noise that it makes while you move. Okay. Another reason I like uh, Al's equipment is you got these big ass butt packs, and you know they're they're very spacious. You fit your basic essentials in there, you know stuff that you are gonna need, and a lot of times you can fit what you need for that freaking uh, patrol, and you don't even need to take a, uh, a patrol pack because you got enough room in your butt pack to fit what you're gonna actually need for the fight. Okay. So just an example. Open my butt pack up. Inside this butt pack, I've got a field stripped MRE. I've got a poncho, uh, you know, and I'll definitely keep uh, you know extra pairs of socks and whatnot in there as well. Okay, so that's just a couple things uh, that you can put inside a butt pack. And if it's a, you know, if you're expecting to be out for hours or maybe a day, you know, you don't need to take an extra pack um, and have more equipment and whatnot. Yeah, you can just keep everything inside a uh, butt pack. Um, so moving on, more team leader specific stuff. You know, I've always, as a team leader, you should have a pair of binos. Um, team leaders, squad leaders, you know, platoon sergeants, platoon commanders, and whatnot. Always should have a pair of binos. It's just you need to increase your uh, your visibility as your report. So you need uh, you need essay on what's going on in the battlefield, uh, particularly if you're setting up an ambush or whatnot. You know, use these binos so that you can scan the area. Um, these right here, these are uh, Steiner Steiner Marines. These are a uh, good piece of gear right here. And uh, I'm not sure if the U.S. military is still using these, but at one point, these were standard issue. Um, over here, <coughs> over here, got some uh, map, uh, map essential stuff. So, you know, you got a lot of different options. I recommend um, when you're talking at the platoon level, at least your team leaders and above should have uh, maps, whether that's a little tiny uh, strip map of your AO that's you know generated off the uh, you know the main map that's uh, that was issued out for the uh, you know the patrol briefing and whatnot. Uh, but each each team leader should definitely have uh, at least at least at a minimum a strip map. Um, your squad leaders, your you know, platoon commanders, and what whatnot will probably have a bigger you know map of the AO. But uh, as far as the team leader is concerned, you should at least have a strip map. And to include with that stuff, you know, you're going to have your, your overlays with the, uh, your routes, your rally points, your objective rally points, um, some of the on-call targets, you know, stuff like that. And that's going to be all attached to your map. And I'm not going to give a big class on, uh, you know, orienteering and whatnot, but, you know, this is just the stuff you need to have as a team leader and definitely as a squad leader in, uh, um, in, your, in your equipment, okay? Um, included with that is a compass. Now... You know, here we are, we're in the 21st century, so, <laughs> you know, definitely need to have a compass on your person. Um, I just generally carry it uh, probably in my butt pack. I can honestly say, I don't think I can recall a single time where I actually used a compass in theater. Um, and the main reason for that is because, like I said, we're in the 21st century, we have GPSs, we have daggers, you know, things along those lines that, uh, uh, that can get you to point A to point B. But, obviously technology always fails. So you always want to have that as a backup um, in case in case you need it. Um, also, you know, if you're in environments like a jungle or heavily wooded area, you know, you might need you might need your point man to have that compass so that you know you're you're maintaining that 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 pathway and you're staying on course. Okay. So along with this equipment, as a team leader, obviously I'm going to have some other things associated with me that uh, you know an individual rifleman might not have on his person um, but I have my map pens for you know making annotations on my map the different colors associated with different things um, I might have a, a magnifying glass where you know you can get up here and you can really get in close to look at different terrain features like contour lines and stuff like that um, you got a little pace counter actually it's funny it's funny I just pulled this out I was just talking to uh, Bruce about this how these pace counters break so they're not exactly the best made pieces of gear but you know they still work in any event that um let's see that's pretty much it for for this in this little pouch i also have a signal mirror you know in the event that you know, I need a signal aircraft or whatnot um moving on there's other things like 
This is actually uh, something I had in a rack, but it's a map protector. And you can put your you can put your map in here, so you know it's protected from the elements because there's nothing that sucks more than your wet map getting wet and all falling apart and whatnot. I remember one time uh, we were at Pendleton doing some training and uh, it was pouring and we had some Lance Corporals walk up to our position. We were doing a uh, land nav course and uh, <laughs> we asked them if they knew where they were at. And the devil dog reaches into the pocket and pulls out this wet, soaked map and he starts to unfold it and as he's unfolding it, it starts falling apart. So obviously he's not gonna get to where he's going very well in that scenario. So anyways, long story short, if you have a, uh, a map case like this, you can protect it from the elements. Um, also, you know, these laminated maps as opposed to these paper maps are obviously way, you know, far better. You can even write on these with your map pens and, and, you know, you can erase your marks and everything. Unlike these where you write on these and they're, they're permanent. So, okay, um, just rehashing again some of the, uh, you know, basic uh, stuff that you will take on a patrol. Um, obviously, here's an un unfield stripped MRE. Um, again, that's his personal preference whether you want a field strip or not. You know, but the difference is, you know, look at the size of this compared to this. Okay, so there's obviously a lot of benefits in field stripping this. And you can also take some of the uh, the items that are more accessible, like your, your peanuts, you know, things like that. You can keep those in your pocket and you can eat them on the move. Um, stuff that's going to be in your, your main patrol pack. You might have some uh, warming layers in there, like a fleece. Snivel gear like your uh, your Polypro, your you know watch cap, your your gloves, um, neck gaiters, you know stuff like that. Um, you also have some rain equipment. Now, if you're going out on a very short patrol and you're taking a bare minimum, your poncho will satisfy that requirement. But if you're going to be operating out for numerous days and you know you want you know something a little bit more. Um, with freedom of movement, you know, Gore-Tex top and bottom, you know, are hard to beat. So every every guy gets issued a Gore-Tex top and bottom. Um, if you want to even cut back some, you can just take the Gore-Tex top and leave the trousers. But you know, if, if you're probably operating in a very wet environment and you don't want to, you don't want to be soaked because when you're soaked, you're miserable. Um, I would take both of these if you can. Uh, if chances are, if you're taking a uh, patrol pack, you've got enough room for a freaking uh, Gore-Tex top and bottom. So. Weapons for team leaders. And this, I, I would say this even goes for uh, squad leaders and uh, platoon commanders. But, you know, as a team leader, you got to think about the fighter leader concept. How much fighting are you going to be doing as opposed to leading? As a team leader, your weapon is your team. All right, so you're directing fires and things of that nature. Um, so with that, I recommend that the uh, team leader, squad leader, um, and platoon commander, for that matter, should have you know, an M4 carbine or you know, some sort of carbine rifle. Um, in this case, I have a uh, you know a 10.5 inch uh, AR-15 um, for for my primary weapon. Now, there's two two schools of thought on this. Now, in the Marine Corps, traditionally, your team leader in a fire team is going to have something like this. He's going to have a uh, either an M4 carbine or an M16 with an M203 40 millimeter grenade launcher on it. Okay. Now that's been the traditional thought for for a while now, uh, but I'm starting to see a movement away from that. And what I mean by that is they're starting to designate the uh, automatic rifle, excuse me, not automatic rifle, assistant automatic rifle, as what's called what's known as a grenadier. Okay. And they're kind of starting to do away with the whole team leader having a 203 aspect of it. Now the two trains of thoughts are your team leader, you know, if he if he has the 203, he can uh, you know paint targets, he can he can put grenades on, on target or where he wants his fire team to engage. Uh, things of that nature. Um, you know those are the those are the pros as far as having a team leader have a 203. The con is, you know, do you really want your team leader sitting there, you know, worrying about you know lobbing grenades on target um, when he should be leading his fire team. Um, so with that, with that type of thought process, you know, it's probably more beneficial to have a grenadier, a designated grenadier, which would be, you know, most likely your assistant automatic rifleman, and he will be the one that's, you know, dropping 203 hate and discontent on the enemy position. Um, so 
I'm going to go ahead and talk about, you know, a, a grenadier in addition to uh, while I'm talking about this team leader, just because of those, like what I said, those two different roles um, and the two different thought processes. So if you are of the mindset that a team leader should have the M203, you know, obviously you're going to have this type of weapon uh, mounted up on this, you know, a, a carbine or, you know, possibly a full size M16 rifle or whatnot, whatever you're doing. If you're in a foreign country or you have an AK, you got a, uh, a GP, is it GP28? 25. A GP25, okay, G GP25 um, grenade launcher mounted underneath a, you know, an AK type platform. Um, so, in any event, um, so those are the two things, two options. The team leader can either have a, a 203 or he can have a, a carbine. Um, again, I can't stress enough, you know, the fighter leader concept. So, if you have a designated, a separate designated grenadier, some of the things you want to take into consideration would be, um, you know, what what is he going to have? If he's a grenadier, you know, his role is to be dropping 40 millimeter hate on the enemy. Okay. So, you know, I've got a couple things here laid out. This is an old school um, grenadier's vest. So as you can see, there's plenty of slots for 40 millimeter grenades. Um, more modern day stuff. This is a belt I actually had in Afghanistan. Um, but essentially you just, you know, just like a cartridge belt, you just wear this on around your waist and, you know, you've got slots here for you know, 40, mil 40 millimeter grenades, whether it be pyro or, you know, HEDP. Um, but those are your options. You can wear that in conjunction with your gear so that you can carry more grenades for this M203. All right, next one we're gonna talk about is uh, team leaders slash grenadiers, okay? So I've already talked about, you know, one mindset or one idea is to have a team leader with, the, with an M203 so that he can, you know, uh, paint the enemy, uh, designate enemy targets with his 203 um, and the other mindset is let's have a grenadier who can actually focus and concentrate on uh, dropping 40 mic mic on the enemy's positions um, and that way your team leader is free to actually do what he's supposed to do with the fighter leader concept and lead his fire team his fire team is his weapon so in any event here's a little uh quick grenadier setup now i've got a uh, old school grenadier vest on that's obviously not loaded up with grenades i don't have any grenades to load in here but uh you know you just you know real easy light vest uh once you just load it up with it's got all these pockets for all these different grenades um and that way you know i still got my magazines down here i can still use my primary rifle as my weapon um, but i also have all these grenades to easily uh, pull from and utilize um, i also showed the demo the uh, example earlier with the uh, grenadier belt where it's got you know it's a belt kind of looks like one of those uh shotgun uh, belts for duck hunting, but uh, it's got slots for grenades and instead of wearing a cartridge belt around your waist You can wear that grenadier belt around your waist and have you know your magazines on your chest or have a chest or a chest rig or something along those lines So in any event here would be a, uh, an example of a, uh, a grenadier's loadout video we're going to be covering the rifleman kit and automatic rifleman kit uh, most of the gear is the same the loadouts a little different for the automatic rifleman we're going to get to that later let's start off with the rifleman's kit um, to begin with on a rifleman's kit we've got our chest rig this rig is almost a copy of the old Alice gear the way it's set out it's just been modernized to Molly um, standard H harness we've got a radio with point to talk mic and earpiece radios here butt pack which is normally full this gear is laid out we're going to cover it in a minute two nalgene bottles one has a stainless steel cup blowout kit magazines we've got eight total magazines one in the weapon on this kit those are rifleman mags suppressor should we choose to carry a suppressor we've got that grenades Grenades should typically be in closed top pouches. I've just got them hanging on here for uh, for display purposes, but um, you carry something around like this, you're just gonna lose it. So closed top pouches are good to have. Um, that's a pretty quick rundown of my, my chest rig. Um, rucksack, I'm running an Oakley panel pack. Um, this is similar to a small Alice pack. I like this because it's a bucket pack. You open up, throw everything in, good to go. Um, I've just learned, I just personally prefer a bucket pack over some of the other um, clamshell type packs that are out there. That's all on that. 
So gear that you would find in there, um, of course, I've got a big heavy duty plastic bag, water filtration system. Uh, your environment's gonna dictate whether this is of any use to you or not, but rather than having to carry enough water for three or four days, uh, my approach is I carry water, but I also can uh, acquire water in the field and purify in the field. This is something that every guy in your squad doesn't need, but if one guy in your squad has it, that's gonna be a bonus, okay? This is one of those shared items. Fire kit, combustion. We've got uh, in here stuff for just basic primitive fire. Uh, gonna be some uh, different kindling, fire starters, char cloth, that kind of stuff. We can make char cloth in this container. Um, some fuel, just a basic lighter. We've also got uh, cutting tools. We've got a knife. This is 01 tool steel carbon blade uh, for striking flint. We've also got ferrocium rod as uh, part of our combustion kit. So that goes with the fire. Um, rocking a little handsaw here. This is um, a Baco Laplander. Uh, these are great for processing small amounts of wood or bone if you're needing to process food in the field. Um, camouflage face paint. We've got some gun oil here just for maintenance of the weapon. I've got some uh, rubber off of a bicycle tube there for making ranger bands. Spare batteries for my radio. This is my battery recharge kit that stays in my rucksack. This has got solar panel chargers so I can charge my radios in the field um, or any uh, uh, personal electronic devices that you need. And also a multitude of batteries. We've got stuff, uh, CR123As, AA's, AAA's, nine volt batteries. Um, and uh, cordage to charge different devices you may come across in the field or you may have on your own. Uh, a pin, um, extra aim point batteries, stuff like that. A uh, piece of plastic, really it's just a piece of mylar plastic. This could be used in a medical situation as a chest shield, but more, more chest seal. But more than anything, I just use this to go on the ground when I'm sitting down and the ground is wet, keeping from soaking up water. So part of my sleep kit, a um, little different approach I want to show you guys today. This is a hammock. Um, if you want to use a hammock in the field, you can run this inside a slit trench if you need to. Uh, or just stand alone as you normally would. It's fairly lightweight. It's very comfortable. It keeps you off the ground. And then in conjunction with that, I've got this uh, as a foam pad, reflective on one side. This could be used for signaling if you needed to. Uh, OD green on the other side so you can keep the, the camo side out if you're worried about concealment. And then this is just a barrier to protect you from the wind while you're in the hammock. Your cover, this is just a thin sil nylon tarp. Uh, this is a 10 by 10. This could be used to set up um, a camo net, a hide uh, over your hammock in uh, wet weather, uh, or you could even make a little A-frame tent out of that. This part of your cover. Um, cooking, as far as cooking goes, uh, standard old timey mess kit. I love this thing. I live out of this thing. I uh, drink out of this, shave out of it, cook out of it, everything. Um, in here I've got um, a small Esbit stove so I can actually boil water to purify or cook hot food if I want to if the time, if the time permits. This is part of the stove. And then there's the, there's a the little alcohol stove. This is just a little wind barrier screen that assembles around the stove to make a little little shield and on that I can set my mess kit and boil water or I can use my titanium cup that's with my kit. In this bottle uh, I've got some cooking oil it's just some some olive oil in case we end up cooking some food there. Uh, as far as food goes uh, I've got a lot of different stuff here I've got just some candy I'm a firm believer in bringing hard candy in your kit because um, one of the things that, that inevitably happens is you're out on patrol you're setting up in an ambush position, your mouth gets dry and you start coughing. A piece of candy will prevent that from happening. So it's very inexpensive, um, gives you a little bit of sugar. And uh, to me, it just, it just keeps me from getting a cough when I'm out in the field. Um, I've got a lot of quick things, just some little nature bars or whatever, some cliff bars that I can grab and go to. These can just be carried in your pocket for, for an on the move snack. Some granola, just high calorie stuff. A little bit of coffee there in the morning if we have a chance to do some coffee. Some drink mix just to pep you up so you're not stuck on water all the time. Uh, this is a, an MRE that's been broken down as 0331 Brent showed in his previous video. 
uh, mountain house. Uh, I've kind of gotten away from MREs and gotten into mountain house. Yeah, you have to have hot water to use them, so that's something to take into consideration. Again, why I have some of the non-cookable foods available, but these go a long way and they weigh nothing, and uh, they're actually quite good. So I'm a kind of a firm believer in the mountain house now. Personal hygiene kit. You may or may not carry this or different things, but there's toothbrush, toothpaste, deodorant, all that kind of that kind of make you smell good, feel good stuff. Uh, dental floss, uh, stuff for my contacts. I wear contacts, eye drops, that kind of thing. And you'll kind of mission dictates as to how much you've got here. Of course, a pair of gloves, boonie hat, neck gaiter, fleece watch cap, my mesh uh, head cover. Uh, this can be used camo, different things. I usually keep it around my neck. It's good for wiping the sweat away, uh, keeping the bugs off of you, mosquitoes when you're set up on a patrol. Of course, a pair of extra socks. I'm a firm believer in wool. This is a pair of wool socks of high wool content. I always carry two pairs of socks, one in my gear, one on my body. I'll rotate those at night at minimum of two. Taking care of your feet is important. I've also got on a wool sweater. It's 100% wool. I'm just a firm believer in old school wool. Um, it can be wet. It still keeps you warm when it's wet, and that's one of the benefits that I really like. I'm dressed in layers today, so I've got my boots on, my wool socks. I've got on a pair of wool long johns and then my pants. I've got on a t-shirt, wool sweater, and then my, uh, my, my, my outer jacket. Um, this outer jacket has a hood. Um, I wouldn't normally wear this cap in the field. I'd be rocking the boonie um, jacket. We've got, a, we've got a soft shell here. This soft shell has a fleece liner that I can zip in if I want to. This one's made by Craig Hoppers. It's really light and it rolls up really small. Um, this is, uh, I keep it treated with Scotch Guard. It's fairly water resistant. I'm really good at keeping the wind out. It is breathable though. And a lot of times like now, I don't even have the fleece liner in it because I've got the wool sweater and it'd just be overkill. We're just getting down into freezing temps now in the morning and it's warming up until almost the 60s during the day. So layers are very important and I just don't need that much, uh, that much warmth. Rifle primary is SCAR 16. Um, Use a standard AR mags. And if you're gonna be moving into the automatic rifleman role, we've got a couple of examples here. This is obviously not the only way to do it, but just a couple to show you what's available. Um, RPK 7.4, this is a Bulgarian unit. Um, I really like the RPKs. Uh, they're light enough that you can carry it and it's not a lot heavier than a rifle. Its method of operation is similar or the same to, to, to a rifle. This one works just like any AK. And um, the, the only real differences in this weapon and a standard AK, obviously it's got a heavier, longer barrel. It's got a built-in bipod. We're running 45 round mags in it instead of 30s, although 45 or 30 round mags would fit. It's got a slightly heavier sling. This one's just got a little pad on it. Club foot buttstock so you can put it into your shoulder under automatic fire. Uh, rear sights adjustable to a longer range. Uh, this one goes out to 1,000 meters and it's also got windage adjustable on the side and that's kind of specific to RPKs um, just so if you're trying to put um, area fire at 800 meters and you've got a lot of wind you can adjust that over a little bit on the fly if you need to. Method of operation of the RPK 74 is just like any other AK. You've got safety lever on the right side all the way down is semi-auto, center location is full auto, all the way up is safe. Just charge the weapon to the rear Make sure your safety's off, bring the weapon to the rear, let it slam forward, and the weapon's ready to fire. It's just that simple. Magazines, this has been covered a million times, but you simply just rock them in front to back, and they lock right in. Uh, so, load out for this weapon on a rifleman's kit. You're looking at at least one magazine in the weapon, really as many as you're comfortable carrying on your person. You're going to have a support gunner that's going to carry more magazines for you. Um, and the cool thing about this weapon, at least for those countries that use the AK-74, is um, same ammunition that's used in the rifles. So you can pull ammunition or mags from anyone and keep this weapon up and running if you need to. Uh, if you're running an RPK-47, um, uh, a 7.62 RPK, uh, those are typically drum fed with 75 round drums. This is a custom pouch that we had made for that. Um, obviously, Molly, Malice, acceptable on the back. Real simple, it's got both a snap and Velcro, and you've got your 75 round drum inside. So as a uh, as an automatic rifleman, if I was running this weapon 
uh, I would have at least two of these drums on my kit and one in the weapon. More drums would be carried by uh, those other members in my squad. The cool thing about this being Molly is that I can take my standard rifleman kit right here. I simply remove eight of my rifleman magazines off the front. And this pouch Molly's right on there. And I'll have two pouches for that, one in the drum. Still not over, not too heavy, not too much weight, but um, I've got the increased firepower of 75 round drum versus a 30 round magazine. Same is true if we move over to something that's say belt fed. This is a belt fed strike. Um, it's, it's almost identical in operation to uh, 249 saw. Um, uses 100 round nut sacks with a 100 round belt. Um, same thing. We've got nut sacks preloaded. You would carry at least two of these on your kit, one in the weapon for 300 rounds. The more you can carry, the better, but it's always a, a, a cost benefit analysis. How much weight do you want to carry versus how much is that going to weigh on you? And how far can you go with that before you become, you, before you start slowing down those in your unit? So these would also be carried by other members of your team. You give each person a couple of nut sacks, say, hey, you have to carry some, wet, some, some ammunition for the automatic rifle. Custom pouch, again, Molly, simple, fits right exact, right where my mag pouches would be on my rifleman kit. And inside, you've got your 100 round nut sack preloaded and ready to go. So that's that. Um, again, that's the cool thing about Molly versus some of the other stuff that's out there, particularly if you've got a rig that's sewn together and you're not able to remove those pouches, it's going to be specific to whatever weapon you're carrying. And you're not going to have the modularity of having something like Molly that you can swap pouches on and move them around. That's why I'm a big fan. Assistant Automatic Rifleman. Your Assistant Automatic Rifleman is going to be the member of your team that's helping to assist in the automatic rifle. In this case, it would be a 249 or strike. That individual is going to carry extra ammunition. That's his primary role. Spare ammunition for this weapon because the automatic rifleman himself is going to be limited as to how much ammunition he can carry because of the weight of the weapon and the weight of the ammunition. The automatic assistant automatic rifleman will have a support role. He'll carry extra barrels. Uh, a weapon system like this has a quick detach barrel system. If you've got an RPK 74, it doesn't, so then that wouldn't apply. So you'd simply open the top cover, lock the bolt to the rear, depress the button that locks the barrel in place, and the barrel comes right out the front just like that. Grab your spare barrel, put it back in, good to go. On a barrel like this, you're either gonna have a carry handle so that you can remove it when it's hot, or a glove to help, help remove it while it's hot so that the, um, the person installing the barrel, which will probably be the assistant automatic rifleman, won't become burned with the barrel. That simple. Uh, he's also going to have in his pack, as we said, spare ammunition, spare barrels, um, and any other support equipment equipment to help keep this weapon up and running. So we may have some advanced, some parts, some cleaning kits, uh, possibly a tripod if you were running a, a tripod on a system like this. Uh, we're getting in kind of a heavier role there, but just to give you the, an idea of some of the options that the uh, assistant automatic rifleman would have in his roles. Okay, so a few little extra pieces of kit that I've got in my normal setup. This is a true first aid kit. There's nothing in here. This is just uh, band-aids, eye drops, chapstick, um, things that are um, comfort items. But uh, the only thing in here that would be a life-saving uh, item would be something like Benadryl in case the person's going into anaphylactic shock. Uh, I've got um, ibuprofen in here, uh, little flu remedies, things like that, mole skin for your feet. Uh, but I typically try to keep this in my pack. This is something not everybody in your squad needs, just maybe one, one or two people per squad. Cordage, I've got bank line. I really like bank line. It's lighter than paracord, which I've all, also got. But um, this is great for smaller tasks, smaller jobs. It weighs less. You can carry more of it per roll. Uh, headlamp, uh, these um, I'm a big fan of. Uh, use them a lot. This one has both a red light, a low light, and a bright light. Sewing kit, this is something, again, not every member of the team is going to need, but it's nice to have. Somebody blows out their pants, you can fix it in the field and rock on. Binos, depending on your position in the squad, these can come in handy. Uh, just used for identifying uh, enemy positions at distance. Also, I've got lens cleaning kit. These are just some wipes. Use these on my binos, but also on your optic if your optic gets nasty and dirty. Finally, your uh, orient orienteering equipment and a mil-spec compass, map, 
map reading tools, right in the rain pad, some extra paper, and a sharpie. Okay, so here's an example of an automatic rifleman. Now, this is a uh, 1980 Soviet automatic rifleman here, so. <laughs> uh, but same concept. So you got an automatic rifle, all right? His rifle is interchangeable with the uh, regular squad's rifles, all right? So he can accept magazines from, you know, the rest of the guys in his fire team or squad. Um, and essentially, this is one of the most um, important weapon systems organic to the for fire team um, because it has the most firepower. Um, you know, think about everybody else in the fire team. You got, you know, guys with rifles and, and whatnot and you know, possibly grenade launchers. But as far as sheer firepower, he's the one that's going to put the most lead on target. So, uh, you know, not only does it carry, you know, uh, a heavier weapon than everybody else, he's got to carry more ammunition. So. His ammunition might be spread loaded throughout the squad, particularly, um, let's say, in the in the U.S. military, where we have like uh, M249 squad on a squad on mag weapons saws. Um, your assistant automatic rifleman and possibly even the rifleman might carry a couple drums with them uh, as well, or nut sacks, um, to support that automatic rifle to keep this sucker up and running and into the fight. So I'm gonna turn it over to Bruce real quick so he can talk uh, more about his um, automatic rifleman setup here. RPK 7.4, this is a 5.45 version of the RPK. The main difference between this version and that of the 7.62 is this one's primarily fed through magazines. There were a couple of experimental drums out there, but you don't see them very often. Uh, they're typically found with 45 round magazines instead of 30. And I've got one here, three in the pouch here. I can carry up to six in these pouches. This is a Soviet style uh, chest rig. Um, designed to carry the support equipment and magazines that a gunner would need. Uh, also, other magazines would be carried by those within the squad, as 0331 Brent highlighted. Uh, differences in this weapon versus a regular AK is the adjustable rear sight, the bipod feature, heavier barrel, generates more velocity, uh, dissipates heat better and can get hotter, longer barrel of course, uh, club foot stock, Everything else on the weapon is uh, really operates the same as a standard AK-74. Sights go out to a thousand meters, and they're adjustable on the rear. Uh, has a shorter flash hider on the front. It's not a lot of flash signature on this gun with the long barrel. Okay, now we're going to talk about some of the uh, you know the specialty um, specialty billets within the you know an infantry squad or fire team. Um, you know, I was. Uh, when I was a young Marine, I was in the uh, weapons platoon, and I was actually no 331 machine gunner. So, you know, I was what's considered a you know a specialty MOS. And as a, as a weapons Marine, you get attached to a rifle platoon. So, a squad of machine gunners was attached to a rifle platoon, and they used us how they saw fit um, as far as attaching us to somewhere. So, um, let's talk about some of the specialties that can be attached to uh, different. Um, you know, rifle squads and whatnot. But here's a machine gun. Uh, this is a M Yugoslavian M53, which is a, a copy of the old German MG42. But uh, this is chambered in eight millimeter. In any event, I'm gonna use it to uh, simulate a, you know, a medium machine gun. So a machine gunner, you know, attached to a squad. You know, you're gonna have your, uh, your medium machine gun, and you're gonna also have, you know, your rounds. So as a machine gunner, I highly suggest that you carry a teaser belt. Now, what is a teaser belt? A teaser belt's gonna be about 30 to 50 rounds of ammunition, okay? And that's gonna be ammunition that's already loaded on the feed tray and ready to go. So, in the event that you take contact, you're able to orient yourself towards the enemy, orient yourself towards the enemy and start laying rounds down range. And what's gonna happen is, as soon as you start laying rounds down range, your team leader's gonna come up with the actual ammo can and he's either going to have it ready to go or he's going to link it together uh, while you're engaging the enemy so that you have a continuous fire, okay? So, anyways, when I was in Iraq and I was an actual gunner in a machine gun team, I always had about 30 to 50 round teaser belt in my M240 Golf uh, medium machine gun ready to go. And uh, that's the way I recommend if you're going on patrol, you have a teaser belt. Now, weapon systems like this, this one actually have a 50 round uh, small drum um, I don't have it out here with me right now, but I do have one. Um, but they have these small drum mounted on the side, you know, and it contains that 50 rounds inside that drum. If your 
country of origin, if you guys have a, uh, a weapon system that has something like that, like a nut sack or a drum that attaches the medium machine gun, that's that's a pretty good option. That way you don't have this big uh, teaser belt you know, hanging around. Um, unfortunately, you know, only, at least in the Marine Corps, we have the uh, M240 Golf or uh, M240 Bravos now, and uh, you know, th there's no there's no issued pouch or contain container that goes on that weapon system. Um, that we have anyways. I'm, I'm sure the Army's got that stuff, but <laughs> we don't have it in the Marine Corps. So you'll have a 30 to 50 round uh, belt um, that's loose like that. And essentially what I used to do, I just you know folded it over the feed tray and then back and then just carried it like that. Ammo for the M240 or any medium machine gun for that matter is going to be spread loaded amongst the uh, machine gun team and it might even be spread loaded amongst the fire team. Okay, remember that the fire team is a whole concept okay so within your fire team you're going to be carrying you know rounds for your squad automatic weapon you're going to be carrying rounds for your medium machine gun you're going to be carrying uh, possibly some extra m203 rounds you're going to be carrying freaking uh, pyro smoke uh, mortar rounds for you know 60 millimeter mortars if you got mortar assets coming with you you know so the weights distributed amongst the whole entire team or squad um, or even platoon for that matter so, you know, you, you're talking about uh, you know, squad on weapons, you're talking about medium machine guns and things like that. These are your heavy hitters in your team. This is what's, this is what's gonna do cause the most damage to the enemy. So, you know, you wanna spread load the love when it comes to weight amongst the whole entire you know, squad and team so that you carry the most, uh, you have the most assets in the fight at all times. You can keep these babies up and running. Okay, I want to talk about the uh, machine gunner augmentation. Now, machine gun teams uh, in the Marine Corps consist of uh, two to three Marines. So you'll have a team leader, a gunner, and possibly an ammo man, depending upon uh, what your TO and what your numbers look like as far as your company's concerned. So if you're a machine gunner augmentation to a, uh, a rifle platoon, uh, let's say you're, going, you're tasked out to go on a patrol with a squad, um, your, your gunner will have his medium machine gun and you should have a team leader with him. Okay, and uh, when you're a machine gunner, you're probably going to be operating off the bipod if we're talking about patrolling. Um, if you're going into an actual attack or possibly a, uh, an ambush position, then you might want to consider taking a uh, tripod so that you have that more accurate fixed fire. But in regards to a regular uh, patrol, um, just a regular combat patrol or possibly a security patrol, you know, you're most likely just going to be off the, uh, the bipod. Now, if you get contact, all you got to do is, you know, if you get contact left, contact right, whatever, you simply turn towards the enemy, throw them bipod legs down, throw that sling over, throw that sucker up in your shoulder, and depending on how you're carrying your machine gun, if you're, con uh, if you're condition three where you only have rounds on the feed tray and the uh, bolts home on an empty chamber, you'd rack the, the weapon at this time. Um, if it's already racked and you just had the weapon on safe, then you'd turn on the fire, and then there you go, you're in your position, and uh, you can start laying some hate and discontent downrange. If you're ready, uh, if you have a team leader with you, he should be laying down right next to you or on top of you and uh, linking up or have ready that next uh, belt of ammunition so that you can continue to fire and have continuous fires on the enemy. Um, nothing's going to break up an ambush more than a freaking getting machine guns in a fight. Uh, once the enemy starts getting some freaking, you know, 7.62 or in this case 8 millimeter on them, then uh, I'll tell you what, that's, they're going to have their heads down and uh, it's going to enable your guys to start maneuvering on them and break up that ambush or decisively engage them, whether it be a near ambush or uh, some sort of contact with the enemy. Um, picking up, again, just going to throw that sucker on the feed tray. And then you can pick up and start moving off. Uh, one more thing and I'll turn it off. Okay, some of the gear for a machine gun team, your team leader is definitely gonna have more ammunition with them. If you have, if you have are fortunate enough to have an ammo man, he's gonna have a crap load of ammo with him, probably about four to 500 rounds in his pack on his person. Um, so your team leader will probably have a spare barrel. Um, he'll even carry the uh, tripod and TNE if you're taking the tripod with you. If not, there's just more room for more ammunition. Um, your actual gunner is gonna have the actual machine gun and he should have a uh, sidearm. Um, 
whether it be an M9 or you know whatever your your country's issued sidearm is, uh, the gunner should have a sidearm and his medium machine gun. This is his primary weapon. Okay, um, I talked about the uh, you know the RPG gunner and whatnot having a actual rifle, a small carbine. In this case, this is your primary weapon. You do not need a, a small carbine in addition to this. This is your primary weapon. This nine mil right here is a self-defense weapon. It's shit's hit the fan. You got enemy coming in all over you, and you know, hey, you just ran dry on your machine gun. You got nothing left, or they're just up on you, and you can't maneuver that machine gun in the close proximity that you need to. You got that uh, that service pistol to uh, provide that protection. So that's pretty much it. Another thing I want to talk about is. In the Marine Corps, we call them assaultmen, 0351s. They are pretty much our demolitions guys. They also carry uh, the small weapon system, um, the equivalent to that. And some of these other, you know, some of these other countries, like you know, some of the old Soviet bloc countries, um, would be probably an RPG gunner. So what I have here is a uh, RPG-7, and you know, I've seen a lot of, um, I want to say, video of how other countries do you know operate these weapon systems and it seems to me that their philosophy is that their their guys with the rpg that is their primary weapon and um you know that's all they have is that rpg um, you know if that's the way you run if that's the way you conduct business that's great um that's all y'all's um prerogative but in the in the u.s military our guys the guys that have smalls they have their small launcher and they also have a you know secondary weapon which is actually their uh, m4 carbine so you know i don't see any reason why um somebody with probably an rpg couldn't shoulder that or not shouldered it but uh put it on their back uh slung it sling it and have a you know an m4 carbine because you only have so many rockets um so you want to have that that gunner that rpg gunner or rocket you know man you want to give him give him something else to defend himself with other than you know just a launcher and you know some some rockets but you know just an example so a rpg gunner is also going to have an assistant gunner and again he's these are going to be attachments to the fighter team but here's a you know here's a backpack and inside this particular backpack i've got uh two additional rockets um, loaded up in the pack so i've got two additional rockets and their boosters and then uh you know you obviously have a rocket you know, loaded inside the launcher, ready to go. Um, if this thing is slung on your back, you're not going to have the rocket uh, loaded up. And I'm, I'm planning on doing another uh, weapons video later on, where we'll actually talk about you know how to how to actually f use this weapon effectively in combat and how to load it and use it and whatnot. Uh okay, guys, let's talk about the, uh, some of the specialty additions to uh, you know your patrol. So you might have, in the Marine Corps, we have a, a weapons platoon, and those are going to be your machine gunners, your assault men, or whatnot, your, your anti-tank guys. So, uh, you know, I know I got a lot of variety of uh, viewers out there, and guys from uh, different countries, particularly the uh, former Soviet bloc countries, that have RPG-7s in service. Um, so let's just talk um, about an augmentation to your fire team for patrol or your squad. So in this case, we have a RPG team. So we have the actual RPG gunner, and then we have the assistant uh, gunner. So the assistant gunner, go ahead and turn around for you, Bruce. Assistant gunner will have the backpack, and inside the backpack he'll have the uh, the extra rockets. Um, he might even have a, a spare rocket ready to go, just like this one is, because with the RPG-7 you got to screw on the, the the booster. Okay, you can go ahead and turn around. So, uh, but your assistant gunner is going to be armed with, uh, you know, a regular rifle, um, you know, spare magazines, just like a rifleman, except he's also going to have the rockets and this is the same in the marine corps with uh with smalls uh we have a assistant gunner or team leader that has uh extra rockets for the small launcher so in this case you know this would this could be the team leader and you have your rpg gunner and he also has the uh, extra rockets for the uh, rpg gunner um, now it's my understanding um, especially with some of the former soviet bloc countries um, that their rpg gunners would be dedicated rpg gunners and pretty much all they would have is an RPG launcher. Um, in the Marine Corps, the the actual gunner with the small rocket actually has a rifle, okay? Um, so in this setup here, I recommend that a gunner, particularly with RPG or small rocket or something along those lines, does have a primary weapon. Now, 
in this case he's got a cream cough so he's got a smaller more compact carbine which i think is is optimal for somebody in his situation because you've only got so many rockets once those rockets are gone you know the battle still goes on uh, unless you've taken the objective and even then you might get a counterattack. okay so having him armed with a rifle in addition to his launcher is ideal and optimal yeah, in my opinion you want to turn around for me so he would just have his uh his launcher slung cross body on his shoulder whatever whatever's most comfortable whatever can help him employ him in the fight and uh, all he's got to do is simply put that rocket go ahead and uh sling your rifle and uh throw that launcher on your shoulder so he can sling his rifle to his back if he, if he needs to okay and then his uh his a gunner or his team leader would, would load the rocket for him. You, you know, load it. So he would load it in there and uh, get the rocket up and going. And then once he's loaded, the uh, gunner would take over from there, obviously. So this would be an example uh, to some assault men or RPG team um, augmenting your patrol and uh, those assets that they could bring to the fight. Thank you, fellas. Awesome. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do before we step off is we're going to do a little uh, inspection of our, our team members. So uh, what I typically do is have, a, have them get on line. So let's stand next to each other, guys. Make sure they got enough room next to each other. So go ahead and uh, take a couple couple spaces to your uh, side step. There you go. All right, so I'm going to be looking him up and down. And what I'm looking for is excessive loose straps, uh, loose gear, anything that's, you know, um, flashy or might give a position away or whatnot. Um, we're going to go ahead and police that up. So looking at the front of them, um, I don't see any excessive uh, straps or anything like that. Go ahead and turn around. Okay, so now I'm looking at the back side, and what do we got here? We got some, uh, some fucking webbing that's hanging down almost to the ground. So obviously that's going to be a no-go. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take care of this for him. So I'm going to fold it up, and I'm just going to tuck it in so that it's not hanging down. And that way it doesn't get snagged up on anything. Just so it's not hanging down and the potential of it snagging on something isn't, isn't that great. Okay. Uh, some straps, like this pack adjustment strap, obviously that's going to be a little uh, little long, and that's you know rightfully so. You need to be able to adjust your uh, your pack strap. So not too worried about that. But what I can do is I can just take it and just you know tuck it in. Some we're just getting it out of the way, okay? So go ahead and face me again. All right, um, so your water source, are his canteens topped off? Again, check that. His camelback topped off, check that. Uh, his, his rounds, make sure all his, his magazines are there. Make sure his magazines are topped off. Uh, he can get comm checks and whatnot. His face is painted. I don't see anything shiny. Um, uh, other than that, it looks pretty good. So the last final thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have him jump up and down a little bit. Go ahead. Okay, not that much excessive noise, okay? There's no uh, metal on metal clanging or anything like that. So uh, nothing that's too unnatural that's, you know, get, gonna give our position away as we're moving through the, uh, the environment. All right, moving on to the next guy. So uh, right off the bat, first thing that jumps out at me is uh, this blue tape on these magazines. So what I'll have him do is, uh, you know, say, hey, go freaking tear that off and, you know, put that away or take care of that. Um, other than that, uh, sometimes, you know, this this is going to be command uh, decision here. Um, some guys, you know, they, they want this this visible red cross because they want to let everybody know that hey, this is my medic medic bag, medic kit, or whatnot. Um, you know, if that's if that's what you guys do. You know, by all means, um, if that's your SOP. Um, if not, I've also seen guys you know have like a like a tan cross or something like that. So something that's a little bit more subdued. Um, but either way, it's it's not that that big of a deal. But. That's just one thing to take in consideration. If you're absolutely like stitch Nazi and you, and, you know, it just drives you nuts, then you know you can police that up. Um, other than that, I don't see any excessive uh, uh, cords or straps or anything like that hanging around. So go ahead and turn around. 
on the back. Everything looks pretty good. Um, you know, make sure his camelback's topped off. Uh, you know, I don't see two canteens on him. Maybe he's got them, you know, in his pack. Maybe he's got some extra water, like a two quart in his pack, which would be perfectly acceptable. If not, you know, I'm gonna be, say, hey man, go go get some freaking canteens or something like that to, uh, you know, have an addition to your camelback because that camelback's gonna run out. If I go and face the front. Go ahead and jump. Right. So it looks good. So uh, again, I just inspected them guys, and they're gonna do the same for me, okay? Because you know I can't see what's on my back and, and whatnot. So they're gonna look me up and down, make sure I'm I'm good to go. All right, next thing we're gonna talk about is crossing danger areas. Now I covered danger areas in my first video. So uh, right now we're gonna actually go over actually crossing them. So you're patrolling down uh, you know, through your path or whatnot and you find a danger area, an opening up that probably an enemy could set up an ambush or some sort of OP and they're observing. Uh, something that's gonna expose you and maybe bring you out of the elements um, for enemy observation. So to cross an danger area, first thing you're gonna do is set up your near side security. So we're gonna go ahead and do that right now. So came to a halt, gave the hand and arm signal for uh, danger area. Now we're gonna set up our near side security. Okay, once we have our near side security set up, we're gonna punch guys across to set up far side security. Okay, let's talk about formations a little bit. So the first formation we're gonna talk about is the stagger column. Now, stagger columns are great when you have to move somewhere at the fastest possible pace. Um, your guys are pretty much uh, staggered, as you can see how we are set up now. Um, and you're, you're, it maximizes forward movement. Um, as far as um, how effective it is in engagement, your firepower is maximized to the flanks. So what that means is, let's say you walk into a uh, ambush where the enemy is set up on your, your side your flank. Um, simply, all we're doing is contact left or right, and you're turning, laying down a base of fire, and then you, uh, you fight through the ambush. Um, you know, you begin your fire team rushes and whatnot. But your firepower is maxed out to the flanks, but your firepower is not maxed out to the front and rear. So if we were to take a contact front or a contact rear, we would have to, our, our lead elements would have to first set down in a base of fire, and then our guys would have to maneuver uh, to the fl to our flank so that we can start engaging the enemy. Um, so again, those are the, those are the perks. It's your probably one of your best options as far as moving movement through an area, um, as far as speed is concerned. But you're vulnerable in your front and your rear. But your max your max firepower is to your sides. Okay, so you know keep that in mind. Um, another formation that you can do is when the enemy contact is likely in the area is a, a wedge is a good formation and that maximize, a wedge formation maximizes firepower in all directions. Okay, so 
Uh, to get my guys in a wedge, I'm simply going to extend both arms out just like this. So I'm making a like a chevron with my arms. So that's going to tell my, uh, my my team members to go ahead and form up into a wedge. Now we only have three guys here in our fire team right now. If there was a fourth guy, he would be past and pretty much online with me. So you'd be forming somewhat of a diamond. Okay. So right now we're in a wedge formation. So if we were to take contact front. All three of us, the guy on the flank, the guy on the, the right flank, the left flank, and myself could sit down in the base of fire and we have firepower towards the front. If we have contact left or contact right, you're simply turning and we have three of our guns in the fight. Again, I'm, I'm simulating if there was a fourth guy directly behind us. Um, so you have almost all your assets of the fire team in the fight with a wedge formation. So again, if contact is likely, it's a good, it's a good formation for uh, you know, movement, a good balance between movement and maximizing your firepower in all directions. Now, one thing you want to keep in mind is you know, if you're operating in more than just a fire team, you know, everybody in the fire team might not be able to see you. So it's important to you know, pass the hand and arm signal down the line so that it goes all the way to the last guy in the group. Okay? So right now, we're in a, a staggered column. Here's are some examples of taking contact while in the staggered column. Contact right! Contact right! All clear. Contact left! Contact left! All clear. Contact front! All clear. Contact right! Contact right! All clear. Contact left! All clear. Okay, some real quick hand and arm signals that are pretty universal. If I do this, this is just a halt, okay? That means we're stopping our movement. It's not that I see anything or uh, that I have spying senses going off or anything like that. If I do this, it's just a halt, okay? So I'm telling everybody in the move, everybody in the column to uh, stop their movement. All right. So let's go ahead and simulate forward movement. All right. So I take a couple steps back. Okay. Additionally, uh, so I just went over. This is you know halt. If I do this, that's freeze. Okay, so whatever you're doing, you freeze. Don't move because you don't know what I see or whoever can give the hand and arm signal for that. Um, you don't know what's going on. So this is just universal freeze. Simulate forward movement. Okay, the next thing we're gonna talk about is uh, hasty ambush. So let's say you're moving through the, uh, you know, the woods or whatnot, the jungle, um, your point man or somebody in the, uh, the formation sees the enemy. And let's say he's moving towards you. He hasn't observed your position or your team's position yet. So what we're going to do is call the hasty ambush. So the hand and arm signal for hasty ambush is simply your fist pumping out towards the direction of, that you want to set your ambush in. So let's say we're moving and I see the enemy. He's off to my uh, uh, right oblique -like, and he's moving towards my position and we want to hit him from his flank. So um, we're going to go ahead and uh, simulate movement. OK, I see the enemy. He's moving towards my direction. So I'm going to give the hand and arm signal for hasty ambush to the right.
Now all our team members are online, standing by, waiting to initiate this ambush, this hasty ambush on the enemy. All right, get back up. Stack crawl. All right, all clear. Okay, so we just talked about a hasty ambush. That is an excellent way if your uh, your unit's moving through a certain area, a jungle, uh, an environment, and you happen to fall upon the enemy and you see him, that's a good way to get your guys set up in a hasty ambush to intercept that enemy unit as long as they haven't detected you yet.